golly, hello. It's so nice to be home. Um, your life, your life expectancy, your health, is better determined by how close you live to a major arterial road than by any genetic uh, predictor or any medical service, actually. Um, Hippocrates said this, actually. He asserted that we needed to treat the outer in order to treat the inner. And so um, I'd like to update his assertions. I'd like to tell you that the grand challenge of the 21st century is to reimagine and redesign our relationship to natural systems. Not only to reduce waste and to reduce food miles and to reduce petrochemical fertilizers and to reduce our negative harm, but in fact, the big assertion is that we can design our infrastructure, our shared food system, distribution systems, transportation, energy, waste systems, to improve human and environmental health, to increase air quality, build soil, increase um, human health. Why wouldn't we? Um, so the way we would do this is through mutualistic systems. And you've probably heard of mutualists, right? They're the subset of symbiotic organisms that don't just coexist, not just proximal, but they actually live longer, reproduce more in the presence of other, these other mutualistic organisms than not, right? But you might be surprised to know that about 95% of the world's biomass, all the corals, all the trees, forests, and pollinators, and flowers, conservatively, 95% of the world's biomass are mutualists. I'd heard a lot about predator-prey relationships and parasitism, the Malthusian idea of natural systems. I didn't know that to the first approximation, the world is a mutualistic system. So can't we design our urban systems to be mutualistic? My environmental health clinic is an institution that prescribes um, people come with environmental health concerns as opposed to medical health concerns, and they walk out with prescriptions not for pharmaceuticals, but for things they can do to improve their own health, right? Their air quality, food systems. If you improve your air quality, the benefits are enjoyed by anyone you share that air quality with. That's not true of the medical model of health. So twisting the definition of health from one that's internal, pharmaceutical, atomized, to one that's in the air quality in this room, in our shared urban infrastructure, is a critical task. I'd like to show you some other mutualistic systems um, and start with the Moth Cinema, which is a silver screen that hangs in a park or a facade of a building that's illuminated by light. And like other urban lights, it attracts moths. But instead of frying and bedazzling those moths, those prodigious pollinators, the moths find a moth garden filled with nectar plants and host plants. So they bounce around casting dramatic shadows as they play out their love triangles, their nightly adventures, their nightly lifestyles. The moth cinema has an intensified habitat that attracts the moths, but also people. It's a, a, a concert hall, if you will, without the hall. It's a venue for new composition. So I compose and commission nocturnes, melodic meditations on the night that we play in uh, the moth cinema as a kind of film score, if you will, to the silent um, spectacle of the moths. And this is a wondrous engagement with um, these important urban cohabitants. I also transpose those nocturnes in real time into the ultrasonic spectrum. These are ultrasonic speakers that you can see. So the moths can enjoy the nocturnes too. And you can watch. Does a moth like that music? Because moths are incredibly good at hearing, right? They're through their thoracic cham chamber. They co-evolved with bats. Butterflies are deaf. But moths have perhaps the best hearing of all organisms. Do they like the music? Furthermore, the ultrasonic, by playing the nocturnes in the ultrasonic spectrum, we're blinding the bats. So instead of having an easy meal, we create a safety shield. So this is a principled engagement, right? Intensified habitat using our strategy organisms with a short life cycle that can lay hundreds, thousands of eggs at a time. And if they do that, the baby birds, all the fledgling birds that depend on those caterpillars, the amphibians that depend on those, the plant reproduction cycle that depends on the 
they all benefit. Right, so this is an example. Moths are happy, we're happy. Um, there's many other ways to augment the presence of non-human uh, pollinators. The butterfly bridge uh, provides a uh, well, safe uh, passage for butterflies. Instead of smearing them like cream cheese on your windscreen, they are attracted to the butterfly-attracting plants, and they bounce across the overpass to, uh, from one patch of healthy urban ecosystem to another, where the genetic flow and the, uh, it actually makes it safer for the humans crossing as well. Um, and an inexpensive way to stitch together the patch ecology of healthy urban ecosystems. We were getting about um, 30 butterflies per hour crossing. And again, it's um, an, easy, uh, an easy fix. When your pet dies, when it becomes an ex-pet, you could, in fact, <laughs> replace it in your grave. This is where Wuppy the wonder puppy is buried in my living room, um, for companionship after death and the 11 years of biogeochemical cycling that happen with the NPK of his dear body. So understanding how our systems are connected has been I mean, it's an interesting challenge. And the phenol phenological clock really helps me understand this. This is, in the Victorian Albert, a clock face. Each one of those arcs is a species. On the inside is flowering perennials. The next set of arcs are the insects that depend on those flowering perennials. The next set are the birds that depend on the, the um, insects. And then, of course, the big biomass of the trees. So that's 85 organisms that live in West London. Um, on a January through December clock face. So when they bud, bloom, emerge, or migrate, they're shown on this um, clock face. So in fact, what we're doing is trying to rethink time, not as mechanistic and empty and nowhere and everywhere the same, but as seasonal, as biogeochemical, in the sensorial, seasonal experience of time that we all enjoy. So changing time, Turning our attention to natural systems is something we can all do. Um, but I, we're in Australia, so I have to talk about sport. Um, uh, what if we designed our sports so they didn't only improve our health, but improved environmental health as well? The strongest animal in the world is not the ant, although they had a very good PR firm. It is, in fact, the rhinoceros beetle which is a difficult animal to interface with, but are really the heroes of the underworld, right? They're like the caterpillars, as in the, the yellow heavy lifting equipment, right? They churn the, the rhizomic layer and aerate and increase the um, microbial diversity in the soil. Um, so this is the rhinoceros beetle wrestling sport, where you climb into the head-mounted augmented reality display, and Optically and mechanically, the beetle forces are scaled to human scale, human forces are play, uh, scaled to beetle scale, so you have a level playing field, right? <laughs> and I take wages on man versus beast. This is how I fund my projects, right? <laughs> um, so uh, imagine if we had high school sports, primary school sports, adult sports, where it depended on these organisms. We'd have a lot more of these rhinoceros beetles around, a much healthier soil, and that toxic turf we call sports fields would be transformed into something that was good for us and the beetles. So um, putting the sport back in transport is something I think we can do. So re-engaging the wonder of flight. And why is it that seabirds have these pointed wings? Once you've used your car as a portable wind tunnel, you can, in fact, explore, strap on your 14, 16 foot wingspan wings and fly um, across as we did in Flight Path Toronto, where we flew hundreds of people on wings, biomimetic wings, across Nathan Phillips Square, past um, City Hall, through downtown Toronto, to explore what fast, emissionless, radically inexpensive mobility might look like, to get beyond the bike lane. I'm sorry, Sydney, you haven't really managed those yet, but <laughs> they're an interesting technology. This is the next step. Um, so this idea that we can, in fact, create a convivial learning context where I'd call this a shared public memory of a possible future. For less than the cost of running 
um, one diesel truck for one year, we can put zip lines up throughout the metropolitan area. In fact, we can start really rethinking what, oh, I'll have you know before you get paternalistic that the most enthusiastic flyers were grandmothers. Right? <laughs> they were the ones that lined up, they had the patience, and they, they, um, so um, this idea that we can enjoy and put the uh, sport back in transport suggests that we can go for a ride. Um, the elevator pitch uh, is, if we continue the shaft of the elevator, taking advantage of the density of urban environments, an extra 15 to 20 percent to produce the view, right, and change those awkward interactions in an elevator, right? You get the building stops, the elevator keeps going. Delightful, right? That actually um, creates a greenhouse effect on top of a building, right, a thermal differential. And with our new technology that smart cities, if they were smart, would use um, actuated vents that would isolate the, sh uh, the shaft in the event of a fire. Instead of spending, as we have for the last hundred years, isolating the shaft, the oldest technology in passive circulation, we could actually replace the biggest consumer. Buildings actually consume more energy than, uh, and have a larger carbon footprint than vehicles in urban environments, and we could, in fact, um, not only does it produce a view, create a ride, but the additional freefall means that we are, in fact, generating more energy and they're tipping the balance from the elevator becoming a power plant for the building, right, generating energy, uh, in addition to replacing that HVAC system that we don't need. Again, and removing displacing those diesel trucks that degrade out. Why do we distribute food in such a way that it gives our kids asthma and degrades the cardiovascular health of each one of us? We can imagine something better. Zip lining goods and people around an urban environment is an inexpensive and possible. Let's skip over to the last project, which is the tree office, an office in a tree, so you could reimagine. Does anybody here like to work in trees? <laughs> yes. So this is a high-speed internet, locally generated power office in a tree. I've done a few of them in Berlin, in New York. Um, and it's based on this tree, the tree that owns itself, um, deeded to itself in 1832 by Colonel William Jackson, who said, who loved the tree and donated, deeded it to itself, right? Unfortunately, that tree died, and so the Junior Ladies Gardening Club came along in 1946 and replanted a skin of that tree on the same eight-foot-by-eight-foot eight plot. And so the, they tested heritability laws, and the tree that owns itself continues to own itself. And this idea that we can extend rights to non-humans is made concrete and possible. Does it make sense to have a tree as a landlord? When you haven't paid, they'll send you a text saying, I'm not going anywhere till you pay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this, uh, and what would a tree use all that income on anyway, right? It would spend it in its own interest, right? In fact, it would develop interesting new technologies. The power system that it uses is a, oh, I'll show you, I'll come back to the roof, um, uses the major waste stream in the urban environment, which is paper, lignocellulosic waste, paper and packaging, right? Um, in the office, we can pyrolysize that to generate clean energy. And the byproduct of that is biochar. When you work biochar into the soil, as Australians with all of our lovely degraded farmlands know, we can actually augment and build soil. Um, but we also sequester carbon for maybe 5,000 years. Plant a tree, you sequester carbon for 100 years or so. Um, biochar, in fact, the, um, the geoengineers in Oxford have said that this is the only viable form of geoengineering we have. Not spraying sulfites in the air or fertilizing the ocean, but Aforestation and biochar, and ABC. So that's how the tree powers it. And in fact, distributing waste makes no sense at all. If we distributed our own waste with just 244 of these garbage bags, glamorous garbage bags, that um, dis distribute our own waste into a local waste energy system, we could, in fact, generate more energy than the Lantau Island super incinerator that's being built in Hong Kong now. Because it makes no sense to distribute waste. So here's another system 
that um, is in fact the roof of the tree office that is a, uh, breaks all the rules of engineering. You never combine hydraulic systems and uh, pneumatic systems except the tree office and all its wisdom. Uh, that inflated pillow actually takes grey water inside. That's the full hydrological cycle. So the water evaporates, condenses, drips down the side, and that's the water cooler, the purified distilled water for the tree office, right? So the recent and final thing that the tree office has come up with, the new service, in addition to office space, it's offering cloud data storage. <laughs> that's indexed the capacity of the cloud data storage is indexed to the leaf area index of the, the trees. So that if you want to increase the capacity, you increase the leaf area index. The leaf area index is the most important indicator of, of human health, the most important metric. Again, for a smart city, we would measure our leaf area index, the, the ratio of leaves over one square meter of territory. And in fact, through this, we could couple the fastest growing sector of the digital economy and the economy, internet services and cloud data storage, to the most critical human health indicator, leaf area index, in the urban environment. Also a great proxy for biodiversity. And so in that way, we can demonstrate, that, and this is actually the prototype of the tree cloud data storage. It uses a high-end self-cleaning oven. That's pyrolysis. It turns everything into ash. Same thing, hacked to now power data storage. We can design these systems, and we can aggregate those small actions into collective action. In fact, we may even, if we cycled all the urban waste this way, we may even hack the Hadley cell so that polluted air that comes from the ports in Hong Kong and Singapore, the busiest ports in the world, and then deposits that black carbon down on the subtropical, down here around Brisbane, Queensland, um, we can hack that cell. So I'd like to finish by saying that these are bet coins, which uh, I invite you to place a bet on producing a future where we can, in fact, seize the technological opportunity, the cultural and environmental urgency to design our shared infrastructure, our food systems, our distribution systems to improve our shared environmental health. We're all going to participate in reimagining and redesigning our relationship to natural systems. Let's. Thank you.